this. It happens, it's going to cross right in front of us, right here. Come on, where are you? Where are you? Where'd you go? There it is. In the world of storm chasing, there's no institution or university that teaches, trains, and prepares you how to document a tornado up close and escape with your life. Get out of here, people. Get out of here. It's coming. But we can seek knowledge from masters in other fields where helpful skill sets may cross over. In this video, we have the great privilege to chat with former astronaut Dr. Sandra Magnus and former Top Gun Navy Fighter Weapons School instructor, Admiral James Winifield. Does fear ever creep into your heart? No. <laughs> Armed with a PhD in material science and engineering, Dr. Magnus has been launched into space three times. She's lived and worked aboard the International Space Station, accumulating 157 days in space. An intense one versus one dogfight is very, very rough. You've got to keep your eye on your opponent. If you lose sight, you lose the fight. In 37 years of U.S. Navy service, Admiral James Winifield was a Top Gun instructor, had numerous command tours, and served as the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Both have a long list of distinguished leadership as commanders, directors, and professors. I looked out the window, I was like, oh my goodness, hundreds of miles of thunderstorms all at one time. I actually got hit by lightning twice in an airplane. Kicked my feet off the rudder pedals, actually burned my lip. It was quite a blinding flash. Together, they host the podcast, The Adrenaline Zone. With the little time we have, I want to learn as much as I can about how Dr. Magnus and Admiral Winifield handle fear, anxiety, and extreme pressure, or lack thereof. We fear the unknown, right? The unknown is scary. I don't know of any experienced pilot that hasn't had the living daylight scared out of him or her. I'm really curious about the psychology and the mental tools they used to one, survive, and two, tackle the colossal tasks and responsibility laid before them. Did they struggle at all with the insecurities so many of us experience, or were they just born with the right stuff? It's an honor to present Dr. Sandra Magnus and Admiral James Sandy Winifield. Hello, Dr. Magnus, how are you? Good morning, Hank. I am doing fine, and it's lovely to be chatting with you again. Thank you, Admiral. It's great to see you again. Nice to be with you, Hank. It's good to be back with you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining me. So, we all love stories about the masters. The best of the best, the strongest, the wisest, the fastest. And everybody relates to the student who's hoping some of that knowledge and wisdom will be absorbed into their brains. Along their journey, a big hurdle is often fear. So, Dr. Magnus, I've heard the space shuttle launch described as violent. A lot of shake, rattling, and rolling. Yet, on your first launch, you didn't seem too shaken up. No, because it was my dream since I was in middle school to go to space and I was finally getting to do it. So I was actually, I was never really ever afraid of doing it. That was my thing. That was my passion. And, and we train extensively for those launches. And so it actually, for the most part, felt pretty comfortable because we have motion-based simulators and we do launch simulations over and over and over again. But that was the real one. So it was actually quite exciting. I actually have it on good authority, Hank, that Sandra was actually laughing all the way up on her first ride. I don't know if that's true or not. Not the whole time, because I had some work to do. <laughs> yeah, that's the rumor that trickled down to me, is that you were laughing. I was giggling a little bit. Yeah, it happened. I was paying attention, too. It was like I was two people. You know, I was the flight engineer focused on, you know, is everything happening right? Are the computers working? Is a checklist proceeding normally? And then I was the 12-year-old girl going, I get to go to space. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> I'm finally here. <laughs> Admiral Winifield, you're in an F-14. You're catapulted off a carrier. Sun goes down. And now it's your first time to land on that tiny little floating runway at night. 
Can you walk us through how that feels? You hear all about it before you do it from other people. And of course, you practice at an airfield where all the lights are out except the little lights in the runway that simulate what an aircraft carrier is like. But the big difference between doing it at the field and doing it for real is there are a lot of peripheral cues at the field. You know, there are lights on streets and homes and things. So you have really good depth perception and you really know where you are, even though you're trying to hit this little spot on a dimly lit runway. At night at sea, it's completely different. It is pitch, pitch black. And in particular, if you are, as I did on my very first landings at night, underneath an overcast. And of course, at least the airfield's moving on you. Uh, <laughs> you have that going for you. So you first show up at you know three quarters of a mile transitioning out of your instruments and into the visual field in front of you. It's like, holy cow, uh, I, I can't see anything. I mean, how am I going to land on that? And what you just do is discipline yourself and say, I've practiced this. I have instruments and I have a visual cue in front of me. And I'm just going to do the best I can to get this thing down there. And eventually you figure it out. In the daytime, it's like the ultimate in motor sports. But at night, it's never, there's never a comfort feeling, particularly in an older airplane like an F-14. The newer airplanes have a lot better systems, uh, heads up displays and things that help you out. This might be a theme where you guys are having to repeat the same thing to the same questions that I'm asking, but it sounds like the routine of practicing over and over and over and over again prepares you. But me, as a musician, there's times when I've performed a song 200 times. And if it's a big gig, I start thinking and I'll get on stage and just forget the lyrics. It's okay. I'm just singing a song. I can just start mumbling stuff. Nobody knows. You guys don't really have a second chance if you mess this up. No, but the training, I mean, it's very extensive, and that's the whole point. Especially for us, we train a lot for the dynamic phases of flight, like launch, like rendezvous and docking, like reentry, spacewalks, and it becomes ingrained. I mean, you're so well trained. It's just normal. It's like you're normal, right? Because you just operate like that. And then you're extensively trained in emergencies and things like that, where we respond almost automatically. I mean, with procedures and everything, but you're trained to respond automatically. So it's really really a habit by the time that we fly. And you know, Hank, one of the things that they do for the emergencies that Sandra's talking about is they realize that you're under a lot of stress when that happens. So we had probably the same thing for the astronaut program, something called Boldface, which is five, six, seven very simple steps that you have to do immediately if there's a problem with the airplane. And if you do those right, then unless it's catastrophic and there's nothing you can do about it, you're going to get the thing under control, and now you have a chance to kind of take a breath and go, okay, what just happened here? Mm -hmm. Coupled with your deep knowledge of the airplane or the space shuttle that they've given you, you can go from there and figure it out. But, but they understand that you're under a lot of stress, so they make this thing very simple in the beginning when you have an emergency. You know, Full right rudder, set 10 degrees nose attitude, throttles both to the maximum afterburner. And you know, those kinds of things where it's just, you know, and you practice them in the simulator, and it's almost second nature. I would also add that when we train for all of our dynamic phases of flight, the training team is throwing malfunction after malfunction after malfunction at us. A typical launch will have zero malfunctions, but a typical training simulation of a launch will have 10, and it's eight and a half minutes. So there's 10 or 12 malfunctions in the space of eight and a half minutes. And so they're forcing us to work and train in a really high pressure environment and figure out how to work as a team very, very efficiently so that the one malfunction that happens in a higher pressure environment feels very simple to deal with because we've yeah. been through this training avalanche. And it's almost funny because you'll be in the simulator and they go, oh, okay, well, uh, they took my right engine away. All right. Well, I wonder what's coming next. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, oh, they've taken my attitude instruments away, or or I can't yeah. talk on the radio, or yeah. it's almost a game, a contest between you and the guy running the simulator mm -hmm. to see what they can do to you. Yeah. Right on. That makes a lot of sense. So, Dr. Magnus, it's your first space shuttle mission again. You're in space. You open the payload doors. Voila. There's the Earth. How does that feel? That was my first view of Earth as I opened the Pale Bay doors, and I had a complete brain-to-mouth moment where I looked out the window, and I was like, oh my goodness, our atmosphere is so thin. I mean, it's just dark. It really hits you. It's a difference between intellectual knowledge 
and experiential based knowledge. People climb Mount Everest, it's 29,000 feet and some change, and they have to use oxygen masks and tanks because its atmosphere is already so thin there. The circumference of the Earth is 25,000 miles and some change. So you can do that math and figure out that our atmosphere is teeny tiny paper thin, but when you experience something, you understand it completely differently. And to look out the window and it's like, wow, it, it, it looks like you know, a little white dandelion fluff. You can you know, blow on the dandelion fluff and it goes off into the wind. That's, what, that's, what our, that's how fragile our atmosphere looks. And so you really, when you see it, you gain a completely different appreciation for the beauty and the fragility of our planet. And it's, it's something I will never forget. Now, thank goodness you're taking all those pictures and sending them back so that we can get some vibe of what that's like. Also, when you're seeing the air glow layer, that's 100 kilometers up. And so people might think it's actually much thinner than that because 75% yeah. of our atmosphere is actually only 11 or 12 kilometers up. So when you're seeing the air glow layer, that might be 1% of the mass that we have at the surface. So divide that by 10 yeah. and that's, and it's even thinner than what you would see. Yeah, it's it's very fragile. It's amazing that this planet is able to support life. Also, yeah, I gotta ask you this for my viewers. Can you tell us about the lightning storms that you saw from space? Oh yeah, so we see amazing things as we go around the planet. We circle, of course, every 90 minutes, so 45 minutes of light, 45 minutes of dark. At nighttime, you can see where people live, but you can really see thunderstorms. I mean, hundreds of miles of thunderstorms all at one time. It was awe-inspiring to see how much lightning, and it's way more than you can possibly imagine, and it looks like a big fireworks show as you fly over a thunderstorm, because there's lightning going constantly in multiple places. It's intense. I've seen some really violent weather and actually have flown in some really violent weather, which is very unpleasant. I actually got hit by lightning twice uh, in an airplane, uh, once in the Arabian Gulf uh, in an F-14. I had just taken off just after dark. And, you know, my backseater and I are sitting there going, you know, they're not going to launch us in this. There, there's no way they're going to launch us in this. Now, they are not going to launch us into this, like, teeth of this thunderstorm. And next thing you know, we're rolling down the catapult. And literally within a minute of taking off, we were hit by a nice big bolt of lightning, kicked my feet off the rudder pedals, actually burned my lip because uh, some of the electrical current came through. You could see when, after we landed the, the, the sort of burn mark where the lightning exited the airplane. We decided not to go out on the rest of our mission. And we told people, <laughs> hey, we just got hit by lightning and uh, came back and landed. And we were just fine. But it was quite a blinding flash. And same thing happened to me in an F5. Exact same thing. Feet kicked off the rudder pedals, little little burn mark on my lip and uh, a little hole on the back rudder of the airplane, literally, where the lightning exited. So it's no fun. Actually, you know, being above it, I think, in Sanders' case, is a lot prettier than being inside it. But, you know, Sandy, when we were flying T-38s, we had to wind around weather because they just have no tolerance. But I used to love being around those big, fluffy, pre-thunderstorm clouds. And some of them were kind of dark. They, it wasn't dangerous yet. But, I mean, that was some of the most beautiful clouds I've ever flown around. Oh, yeah. We used to call it fighting against clouds. If you had nothing to do and you're not in controlled airspace, let's say you're out over the water and you get by one of these beautiful cumulonimbus things, particularly if it's isolated, you can just drive around, do loops over it. And, you know, you feel a little bump when you go through the edge of it. It's exhilarating. And they're beautiful. Some of these cumulonimbus updrafts, at least in Tornado Alley, you can have air moving up 100 miles per hour. So you also have the hailstones, the suspended hailstones. Mm -hmm. So are they big no-nos to go through the core of these things yeah. or? Yeah, it's absolutely. A no -no. Absolutely. Yeah. You do anything yeah. you can to avoid it. And the only reason I've only really been hit by lightning twice is uh, the second one in the F5 was an air traffic controller mistake who vectored us into one of these things. And we probably didn't go through the very center of it. We were on the edge of it, but deep enough in where we got hit. And then the first one on the F-14 was out in the Arabian Gulf, where there is no air traffic control, really, for what we were doing. I think that was another mistake. Yeah, so you definitely want to avoid flying in a thunderstorm. No question. Commercial planes, they're constantly trying to avoid bad weather and updrafts and turbulence. I was shocked when I was listening to the radios the first time I started flying in the T-38s, how much time airline pilots spend talking to air traffic control to avoid bad weather. But we spent a lot of time picking our way around clouds. Yeah, it can be tough. Some of these thunderstorms are explosive when you have these, you know, high volatile days. Once it starts, yep. and sometimes when it's a squall, you can just get a whole line, you know, 100 kilometers of just boom all at once. Mm -hmm. So I could see where sometimes you have no choice 
but to barrel through it. Yeah. And fortunately, you know, these airliners and Maya 14, we have a radar, so you can literally see it. And if air traffic control is not preemptively moving you around, you can go, hey, guys, um, <laughs> well, mm -hmm. I don't like this thing in front of me. Can I come right 10 degrees to get around it? Yeah. Uh, and they generally will let you divert because they don't want to be responsible for putting an airliner through a thunderstorm. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Dr. Magnus, again, you're on the ISS. You finished your work, I was going to say for the day, but I should probably say for the period, right? Because you've got what, 16 days in our 24-hour period. Everybody who works on space station, all the ground teams all over the world and the crew, we work on Greenwich Mean Time. So we do have a day, although it's defined as a 24-hour period based on Greenwich Mean Time, but it, it has nothing to do with day-night cycle. So it's the end of the period. You've been working all day. They're keeping you busy. You've got a lot to do. Now it's time to retire to your sleeping chambers, and you've got a little time to ponder how alone you are, how far away you are. Meteors. Does fear ever creep into your heart? No. Actually, I never really felt alone. <laughs> I mean, I had, I don't know, hundreds of people watching me all day long on camera. So we had a ability to make telephone calls to the ground through the satellite systems. Um, I could be on email. I had other people with me. So I never really felt alone. In my downtime, I took tons of pictures because our Earth is so beautiful. So I spent a lot of time taking pictures and cataloging. But no, I, I, it was my job. And it was, again, what I've always wanted to do. So there wasn't really a fear thing. It's funny, we're very adaptable as human beings. When I was living on space station, I quickly normalized to this is my life to the point where a couple of months in, I realized, wow, I'm not spending as much time as a window as I ought to because this is not normal what I'm doing, even though it felt very normal to me. That was my house. That was my workplace. It was just my life. I've watched a few videos of you doing interviews from the space station. And there's one in particular, I think you were with Dr. Ferguson, maybe. He's got his hair nice and, and straight, and he's got this very straight posture. And then you're there, and you've got your hair just sticking straight up. You're, you're, you're upside down, and, and you've got this grin on your face. And I'm just thinking, she's home. You <laughs> totally. look like you're home. <laughs> totally. I noticed in your interviews, and I thought this was kind of interesting. I don't know if I'm seeing things right, but you guys kept taking your hands and you would you would do this. And I thought, well, they're in space. There's no gravity bringing your arms down. And I was wondering if you just relaxed and you were on camera, would you just kind of <laughs> start doing this? Or, I mean, do you have to manually hold your hands so that you don't look like a zombie when you're on camera? Your natural body position in zero G is, you know, all your muscles go to their neutral zone, right? And so your arms kind of float in front of you and your legs kind of bend a little bit. It's very comfortable. Just relaxing with your body in neutral zone is awesome. <laughs> so, Admiral, around six or seven Gs to avoid G lock, and I don't know if I understand this correctly, pilots are physically grunting manually trying to force blood to their brain. Well, it depends. Uh, if you're in a sustained 4G turn, you're, you would probably be doing a little bit of that. But, you know, you could find yourself, if you're in the middle of a dogfight, at six or seven Gs for upwards of a minute. That's when the battle for blood begins, is you're really just trying to fight as hard as you can to keep the blood up in your brain. And there are two ways you do it. On the one hand, you're wearing what's called a G suit, which wraps around your belly and your legs and plugs into the airplane. And when the airplane senses that it's under G, it depresses an air valve and inflates that G suit, we call it. It can put a tremendous amount of pressure, actually, depending on how it's fitted on your legs and your stomach. So that's helping you keep the blood up in the upper part of your body. But in order to keep it really up there so you can focus, you have to sort of manually tighten your tummy muscles up as much as you can. And they teach you that in order to do that, the best way is to grunt. So sometimes if you listen to the tape, of somebody who's in a really intense dogfight, you know, they're, uh, 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 you know, they're, it, it's almost <laughs> grotesque in, in the way it sounds, but you're really just trying to keep the blood up in your brain. We were just in Florida and we were down on the overseas highway and I think it was an F-16 that just did this rocketing bank right around over the freeway. And of course, everybody, uh, and it, to us, it looks like this smooth ride. It's, it's not a smooth ride, is it? 
Well, it depends. If you're a smooth pilot, it can be a smooth ride. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, in, in, uh, when you're, you know, again, like an intense one versus one dogfight is very, very rough. And constant unloading to zero G, reloading up to, you know, six or seven, eight Gs, whatever type of airplane you're in. And you're trying to do a whole lot of things at the same time. You know, you've got to keep your eye on your opponent. If you lose sight, you lose the fight very quickly. You're trying to maintain a perfect airspeed in G because the way the airplane performs is very, you know, how it turns is very dependent on you managing that airspeed almost perfectly. You're trying to manage a weapon system. You're trying to make sure you don't run out of gas. You're trying not to hit the ground. I mean, you're watching your altitude. And you're doing all of these things at the same time. And it's like four-dimensional chess under six and a half Gs. It's exhilarating. It's a lot of fun, but it's hard to learn. It's hard to get good at that, but it's an awful lot of fun. I call it the ultimate in motor sports, along with taking off and landing on an aircraft carrier. It's pretty challenging. We call it superhuman marvel. No, no. <laughs> I, trust me, you don't have to be superhuman to do this. You just have to be really well trained. And, you know, there are certain characteristics of people that make them better at this than other people, one of which has to do with hard work, frankly, paying attention to what you're doing and trying to get as good as you can at it. There's a little hand-eye coordination involved, but it's not superhuman, Hank. Uh, there's lots of people out there flying in fighter airplanes that are pretty average like me. <laughs> in the movie Top Gun, Tom Cruise is portrayed as kind of a fearless maverick, perhaps even a little reckless. Does that attitude really fly in the Navy? No, maybe to a, a, a very, very small degree. Uh, because we do want people to be aggressive. We want them to be thoughtful and creative and think out of the box and those sorts of things. But when it comes to flying the airplane, we really need people to have flight discipline, to understand the airplane, to understand the rules that have been written in blood and how you operate those airplanes and to stick to those boundaries. But again, we do want people to be creative in an open way, but definitely not reckless. There's no room for recklessness. Uh, you, you will die very quickly in a fight or in low altitude if you're reckless. After my first 60 or 70 tornadoes, I started to become kind of fearless, mm. um, very confident, perhaps overconfident, and being younger, maybe even a little arrogant. A year later, I put myself in between two tornadoes. A tornado sandwich almost killed myself. Are there healthy levels of fear? I don't know of any experienced pilot that hasn't had the living daylight scared out of him or her because of something that happened or maybe a mistake that they made that was a close call. But there's a saying that says the really good pilot uses his or her superior judgment to keep them out of situations that require their superior skill. <laughs> and, and so what we worry about is complacency, exactly what you're talking about, where we're doing these things that are very much on the edge of technology and human skills, and there's not a lot of margin for error when mistakes happen. But yet mistakes will happen because we're human beings. And what can happen is if you're successful, you're successful, you're successful. It's very easy to get complacent and, again, fall into this norm where, okay, this is just the way it goes. And then not remember that you're doing this thing that's on the edge of, of what's possible. And if you have a culture where you're not transparently sharing mistakes and lessons from those mistakes, or if you're in a culture where people get lazy about following checklists or processes, the consequences of, of that are the Columbia accident, the Challenger accident. So the challenge in our community is continually trying to make sure that the complacency doesn't become embedded in the culture, and then we continue to be learning from our mistakes and being open and transparent and making sure that the right conversations are happening all the time. But it is, complacency is a human nature factor, and it's, it's easy to go there. Sandy. And I would add, Hank, that one of the biggest responsibilities of a leader and, you know, an experienced leader in one of these, mm -hmm. whether it's a fighter squadron or maybe probably the astronaut corps, and I think Sandra was the deputy head of the astronaut office, is to be alert to people who are really good, but who are starting to drift into this overconfidence place and to kind of rein them back in. Very important for experienced leaders to be willing mm -hmm. to do that rather than just watch it happen. Yeah. Great advice. Thank you guys so much. I feel like my community 
the guys that I hang out with, we constantly do that. We constantly monitor other people's mistakes just as much our own mistakes. And we feel like it's our duty to discuss, guys, this was the mistake that I did, you know, mm-hmm. because some people might look up to us. So perhaps they can avoid it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And you are learning from other people's mistakes is a very important thing to be able to do. I think I've told Sandra about this before when I was a squadron CEO in an F 14 squadron. We had a sister squadron who had the very first woman pilot in the F 14 community. And she had something that it turns out we had never seen before in that her approach turn on final to get to the carrier where the airplane's in a relatively steep bank. She lost her inboard engine to a, a compressor stall and uh, lost control of the airplane. They ejected and she did not survive, but her backseater did. And of course, this was at a time when having women in those kinds of positions was a little controversial and some of the media seized on this. You know, see, you should never have let women into the cockpit. And I, I took the other approach. I said, holy crap, you know, I don't think I've ever heard. I've lots of practice that we do on losing an engine on a catapult shot, but not on that last final approach turn. We better go to the simulator. Sure enough, we went to the simulator and a lot of my guys lost it the exact same way she did. And we did a little extra training and over the course of an afternoon, everybody kind of figured it out and big relief, right? Now I think my guys can handle this a little better than they could before this happened. We learned from what happened to this unfortunate young lady. And I was also able to go to my chain of command and say, look, this is this is ammunition you can use to fight against this really stupid narrative. Uh, the women should not be in cockpits of airplanes. It's like this could have happened to anybody. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that's just one anecdote, but it's about how you really need to take those unfortunate circumstances and learn from them. Yeah, hopefully her experience has saved a, a few more pilots by bringing that to their attention, just like you said. That's what you want. The consequences and mistakes in our community is very high, and you don't want to waste those lessons. Yeah. Truly. Dr. Magnus, I have... I'm very fortunate to just have low anxiety. Some other people in my family just naturally have high anxiety. But on nights before expected tornado outbreaks, and this isn't fear, it's it's more of a nuisance. The anxiety might be enough to keep me awake at night a little bit. And that's okay one or two nights in a row, but after three or four nights, if I'm thinking too much, and that anxiety keeps me awake, your candle starts to dim. Have you guys had any training against just general overthinking and anxiety like that? Is there, a, is there, is, does mindfulness play a part? Is there any lessons that you've given on just dealing with normal doses of anxiety so you can sleep at night? Well, I think the most important thing that you need to do is understand to, how to recognize when you're stressed out and you're in those frames of mind. And then understand what your particular relaxation techniques are. Like for me, it's exercise. Yeah, I was a big runner. And so if I found myself wound too tight, I would make sure I would get out and do a run or go to the gym, lift some weights or do some yoga or whatever. So understanding yourself well enough to know to recognize the signs when you're anxious and stressed out and then understanding yourself well enough to know what you need to do to relax is super important. Admiral Winifield, can you chime in on this? No, I 100% agree with Sandra. Each person deals with this in their own way. And I like to just sort of put things off in a corner and forget about them until I, I, I control when I bring it out and think about it. That helps me focus on what it is I'm supposed to be focused on. And I think there are a couple of types of anxiety. There's the anxiety in the moment when something happens that you have to deal with, uh, whether it's on the ground or in the air, it doesn't matter. And you just sort of tell yourself, okay, I got a few things I got to do right now. And I'm not going to be bothered by the enormity of what's going on. And then to your point about you know sleeping, I never lost a wink of sleep worrying about something that was going to happen in the air. It was always something on the ground, you know, like, I hope we pass this inspection or we, you know, do whatever, something that could affect your reputation, something beyond your control, whatever. But generally, you could even deal with that. It's like, look, I'm going to go to sleep thinking of something pleasant, something else, rather than letting this because it wins if I let it intrude on my sleep and I don't want it to win. We got to talk about leadership. For roughly two weeks a year, I join a scientific field operations team with the objective of gathering near surface wind field data around tornadoes. And the closer we get, the better the data. It's a three vehicle team and we rotate captains. 
when it's my turn to captain, not only am I partly responsible for keeping them out of danger, and I say partly responsible because mutiny is built into the system. They can say, <laughs> I'm not following you. <laughs> but the weight of them missing a big event because my forecasting was off sometimes exacerbates second guessing. Is there any advice you can give to people who are beginning to take leadership roles? I talk a lot about leadership to various audiences. It's something that I've studied my whole life. It's not something that, for example, many businesses focus their training on. They sort of think you gain leadership capability by osmosis, but it really is a complex undertaking and it's not for the lazy or the faint of heart. There really are no born leaders and there's no single soundbite or slogan that'll transform somebody into a great leader. You have to put in the work to learn the craft. And that's sort of a lifelong journey that requires, in my view, three things. You know, lifelong study, which means reading about leaders or leadership whenever you can. It means observation of other leaders, both good ones and not so good ones. You can learn from both of them. And also practice, which in the military we call running to the sound of the guns. Anytime anybody gives you an opportunity to be a leader, you ought to take it, especially if you're a young person, because you're forgiven if you're learning. If you're an older person, you're not that great of a leader, then it gets a little more difficult. And I tried to have or develop a mental framework on which to hang whatever leadership knowledge I find. And I find new leadership knowledge every single day. Uh, and that sort of framework, I, I, I sort of have five elements to it. You know, one is leading yourself. Another is leading people, understanding and leading people, leading organizations and how organizations work, leading execution, making things happen effectively, safely, you know, and all that. And then one of my favorites is leading change. So if you can sort of start binning your knowledge that you gain inside some sort of framework, whatever works for you as a young person, and just be determined that it's a lifelong journey of learning, then you might have a chance to get into a good leadership position someday and excel but it takes work. Yeah. So, so I would say for someone who's just getting started, you know, it can be scary, right? All of a sudden you're responsible for these people and for this or whatever this thing is. And so point number one, trust your team, right? Recognize that you guys are all there and you're leading a team. You're not by yourself. And when I was running AIAA, there were three things that I thought were the most important that I did as the leader it was number one, I was the energizer bunny for the group. It was my role to Get everybody psyched around a mission, psyched around a vision, because you can't force people to follow you. You have to inspire them to follow you, right? Number two, I was a person who was responsible for asking questions. Again, the team was, it was a strong team, and my job was to make sure that in the context of where we were going as a group, we were trying to work out the paths we were going to take, how we were going to execute. So asking the questions to make sure everybody's thinking when they bring solutions. And then number three, my role is to make the decisions because somebody in the group has to make a decision. It's good to have a conversation. It's good to elicit input from everybody and make sure you're drawing on the strengths and weaknesses of the team. But at the end of the day, somebody has to make the decision. You can't run by committee. And as a leader, your job is to make the decision. And so after we had the debate about how we should do what it is that we're going to do, I would usually explain why I made the decision I did so that everybody recognized that, you know, I had some logic and I was listening to what they say. And that keeps everybody engaged and, and really people just want to feel like they've had a voice. Most people recognize there has to be a decision maker and that's your job as a leader, but they want to be heard, right? Yeah. So we should accept leadership roles. We should brace them and challenge yeah. them when they're presented yeah. to us, especially these low stake leadership roles to begin. Young leaders in particular have to be careful of several pitfalls they can fall into. One being... Uh, okay, I'm a leader now. That means I just sort of sit back and relax and kind of direct the organization and, and don't do anything else. When in fact, a leader probably has to be the hardest working person in an organization if they're going to be effective. And the other is it can be hard for a young leader, uh, particularly coming out of an established organization, to be given a chance elevated above his or her peers to become a leader of a unit of, of some sort. And that can be very uncomfortable for a young leader. It's like, hey, I still want to be part of that group but now I'm forced into this, you know, sort of leadership position and I'm going to have to make difficult decisions that might not be so popular anymore. You know, they put you there for a reason. Go for it. And and don't worry. I mean, you don't want to be an idiot about it, but don't worry about the fact that there are people who might be looking at you like, you know, that should have been me, not you. Just do your job. Yeah. Yeah. And everything will be fine. So looking out for the pitfalls as a young, particularly inexperienced leader, something you got to do. 
Yeah. And I've been in situations as a young leader where I probably didn't ask for help when I should have, because I was trying to prove myself and it was actually was counterproductive, not asking for help a little bit sooner because it was it was leadership of your peers, which is the hardest leadership that you can do is a leadership of your peers. Because as an astronaut, we are in a very flat organization and we are constantly moving from positions of leadership and then back into the group as a follower. So we have to be able to go back and forth across these roles with the same people over and over in different situations. It's not like even in the military where you start rising through a hierarchy or in a company where you start rising through a hierarchy. We are constantly moving in and out of leadership roles against our peers. And so as a young leader, especially trying to understand when things might not be going well or how do you, who do you ask help? And that could be mentors, trusted agents, people to bounce ideas off. There's nothing wrong with that when you're in a new situation is reaching out to, to someone to just get a, a ground check. But to Sandy's point, even the people in the group who might disagree with you over time, I found explaining why you're making decisions you know, you build a reputation for integrity, you build a reputation for transparency, and that's really important in over the long run. That's very helpful. So this kind of tethers into, in, into science and the acceptance of truth. And for me, the acceptance of truth can be scary. Like the making the commitment to follow the data and, and root out your biases can be scary. Um, to me, this all is just critical thinking and the scientific method. Have you guys, do you have any advice as far as accepting truth? Oh. Go ahead, Sandy. Yeah, that's a toughie. I mean, it's all about critical thinking and, and kind of setting your emotions aside and, and following the path where the data is. I, this whole idea of, of, taking facts and using them to reach conclusions seems to be a lost art more and more. And it's, it's a little frightening for me to see how people can make statements nowadays that are completely lacking any factual background and others take those statements as truth. It's very scary. I think, I think, you know, as, as humans, we talk about fear a lot on the, uh, today and I think we fear the unknown, right? The unknown is scary. And so I would just argue the more data you get and the more facts you get, the better you can sort through and get more comfortable with what before was unknown. But you have to be willing to face what the facts are telling you, good or bad, in order to deal with the problem appropriately. But it goes back to critical thinking and being willing to use critical thinking to solve a problem and not jump into comfortable thought patterns just because they're comfortable thought patterns. I agree. I feel like it might be scary at first. But once that fear goes away really fast, like, oh, this is a scary idea to accept. But to my surprise, it went away really fast because now I have the knowledge and the unknown is mm -hmm. shrinking and smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah. So, yeah. Admiral, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, Hank. You know, the, there's an old saying that uh, the first job of a leader is to face reality. And the last job of a leader is to thank people. And then there's an awful lot of work in between, right? But that facing reality uh, requires you to do something that is not a natural act for a lot of people, and that is challenging assumptions. And you know, in the military, we have a, sort of a technical definition of an assumption is that it's a belief or uh, you know something you think might be a fact that if it is not correct, means you have to change your plan. And challenging assumptions is not something that adults like to do. I have a saying that I've coined that's uh, incredibly bright adults will work unbelievably long hours perfecting fundamentally flawed concepts. And the reason why those concepts are fundamentally flawed is that nobody has challenged the assumptions. And you find that some of the most successful people who have ever lived on our planet were really good at assumption challengers. Uh, people like Steve Jobs, who challenged the assumption that you couldn't put a pod, a phone, and a camera together. Nobody else could do the art and the science melding that he did to create the iPhone. And you know, it's changed the entire world. So challenging the assumptions is something we have to do. And, and just in a, in a current context, I worry sometimes that our military, as it looks to potential antagonists, is molding its assumptions to the way it likes to, to operate. Uh, and, and that's the first sign of failure, is that you, you cannot change your assumptions to match what you believe. You have to stare those assumptions down, challenge every single one of them, and see if your plan still survives. Yeah. That's a really good way to put it, Sandy. I like that. 
Yeah, agreed. I was all this, you know, trying to prepare for this discussion. I've just is reinvigorated my love for you know fighter jets and 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 you know and and astronauts and and just last night revisited the right stuff for the first time in in twenty years and just goosebumps. But even in that movie, they were talking about whoever has the tech is on top. If we can accept the data, we can help you out. We can help our country out, especially in this day of the algorithm. Yeah, it makes sense to me. And I think that without getting into philosophy or politics or anything like that, I I just think that it's terribly, terribly important that we do the very best we can to educate our young people in all manner of things uh, uh, to include a very strong math and science and, you know, education that can be useful to them, whether they become a history teacher or whether they become an astronaut. They really ought to have that, the fundamental knowledge underpinning that allows them to challenge what they're hearing and to have the courage to say, you know, what I just heard on TV doesn't make any sense. And I'm not going to go with the herd. I'm going to go with what I've learned, what I, what I can deduce for myself based on this very solid education that I've gotten. And I think that's something that we just don't pay enough attention to in our country. And I, I honor all the teachers who are out there. No question about it. They sacrifice so much. Uh, they're underpaid, overworked, but we just have to make sure that we get the, our kids the best possible education we can get them. Yeah, you know, the other thing I just comment is we talked about earlier how people are afraid of the unknown. Well, change is unknown, right? But the human condition is all about change all the time. That's very scary when things change because it's very comfortable in a zone where what you know is the only thing you ever have to deal with and that it's static. Unfortunately, that's not the way life is. And so understanding how to deal with change, how to face change, how to you know go to the assumptions that maybe you've lived before that aren't aren't applicable anymore or or whatever is it's a life skill because life is about change. Things are always changing in good ways and bad ways, and you know, just parallel with no plus or minus, but you can't not live and not deal with change. And you have to find mechanisms to get comfortable with it. And critical thinking and is is one of those ways to, to do that. And if you can get young people to embrace the idea that Sandra just expressed, you know, that change is inevitable and you embrace it, you actually start to find that in most cases, it can be a lot of fun. Some cases, Agreed. not so fun. But uh, but if you, it's really fun to lead change, which is why I mentioned in those five sort of pillars that I talked about that the most fun one for me is leading change. Yeah, it's challenging. I mean, you get to test yourself all the time. It's like, wow, can I do this? Can I do that? You know, can I adapt to this? And you can. We're hugely adaptable, as I've already talked about. So it's, it actually can be quite fun, as Sandy said, to embrace change. In my personal experience, I was going to agree, yeah, that the unknown is actually exciting to me now, mm-hmm. whereas before certain unknowns. I'm sure there's some down there that subconsciously are freaking me out and I'm going to try and ferret those out. But for me now, the unknown is exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. And, and uh, part of emerging from the unknown with an innovative way of doing something or innovative technology is all about, in many cases, bringing two disparate ideas together that have never been matched into something brand new. And I think that uh, in order to be able to do that, you either have to have an individual who has well-educated themselves, both in their profession and broadly, so that they can reach out over here and, hey, you know, I just read this in Scientific American and I read this in Newsweek and boy, what if we put these two things together? Wouldn't that be a cool thing to try? Or it takes uh, a group of people who are very diverse and well-led and empowered and uh, able to be frivolous in being creative putting them in a room and having them come up with two disparate ideas. But somehow you got to bring them together uh, because that's how creativity happens. I remember hearing Dr. Magnus talking about how on the ISS, diversity is such a good thing because people come at problems at different angles and different slants. So you're just much more likely to to solve a, a problem. Yeah, you get better solutions the more diverse of a group that you have. Yeah, and if they can set their egos aside so that, so that they can actually acknowledge and honor that somebody else had a, con- a contribution to make to this thing we're trying to solve, rather than it's like, no, no, it's all my ideas. That can make it even more powerful, a collaborative spirit. And that happens more when you are you have a group that's really tied to getting the mission done no matter what, and the mission is the goal. 
look at the space station. It's really complicated program, 16 countries, all kinds of languages, political agendas, whatever. But it happened because everybody who was engaged believed in the goal. And we had a diverse group of people. And yeah, did we have a lot of complicated conversations because there's so many different lenses on how to do something? Sure. But we worked through it because everybody wanted it to happen. So you have a group committed to a goal, they're going to put their egos aside, or eventually you'll get to the point where everybody's working together. But it's really powerful. Well, with that, guys, uh, Admiral, what's next? Oh, I'm just having an awful lot of fun. I have a, a, a saying in my own mind that if you don't stay busy, nature will spit you out. <laughs> uh, and so I'm staying as busy as I can. And one of the most delightful things I get to do these days is to do this Adrenaline Zone podcast with Sandra. I dreamed the thing up, but it was very quickly, very apparent to me that I needed to have a female partner who has taken risk, who's smart and has a really good perspective on things. And luckily, Sandra said yes. So one of the great fun things I get to do is this podcast. Uh, but there's a lot of other things as well, uh, trying to keep the creative juices flowing, take a little risk now and then, but uh, I'm in a good place in life right now. Dr. Magnus, what's next? Oh, I'm like Sandy, I'm in what I call smorgasbord career mode. The podcast, of course, has been just amazing meeting so many people that do interesting things like the tornado chasing that you do, Hank. And then I'm a part-time professor at Georgia Tech, and so I spend a lot of time working with students, which I really enjoy because they're just amazing. I worked with students a lot at AIAA as well, and I'm, I'm really just impressed with the aerospace community and what they're doing and doing a few other things, you know, trying to help the industry succeed and continue our efforts in space. And by the way, for those who might not know it, the Orion capsule is circling the moon even as we speak right now, which is super exciting. Yeah, finally made it up. I know. I wish I could have been at the launch. That must have been super impressive to be down there in person. Well, guys, I wanted to thank you so much for spending some time with me. And I'm going to make an offer that I don't make. There's always going to be a seat in, I call it the windbreaker. That's my car. If you want to see a tornado, if you want to see a supercell, I've reserved a seat for you guys. If you want to do something risky, Give me a call. Let me know. Okay. And I would love to put you in front of a tornado. I'm sure that that would get my adrenaline up pretty high. So you, you may have a taker. Thank you, Hank. <laughs> All right, guys. And, and thank you both for your exemplary service. And I really look forward to chatting with you guys again. Excellent. Same here. Thank you. And be safe out there on the road chasing those tornadoes. <laughs>